With that, I would like to uh, uh, ask uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Polyakov to come forward with his testimony. Professor, welcome. Thank you, Senator Serino, and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to be with you this morning. I'm Michael Polyakov. I'm the president of the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, which is known for short as ACTA. My roots are in academic life. I founded and chaired the Department of Classics at Hillsdale College, and I've taught Latin, Greek, and ancient history at Wellesley College, Georgetown University, George Washington University, and I still slip away, as I did last night, to teach an evening course at George Mason University online. I've served as Pennsylvania Deputy Secretary of Education, uh, Director of Education Programs at the National Endowment for the Humanities, and Vice President for Academic Affairs and Research at the University of Colorado. What I'm trying to say is that my heart is in higher education. My organization since 1995 has advocated on behalf of high academic standards, accountability, and the free exchange of ideas on America's colleges and university campuses. We are pleased today to offer our support to Senate Bill 83, the Enact Ohio Higher Education Enhancement Act. As is the case with all large omnibus bills, there are sections that we hope will be refined and improved during the amendment process. But overall, we enthusiastically commend this legislation's visionary boldness at a time when American higher education is in urgent need of a course correction. We are very pleased to see the emphasis on thorough training of university trustees and a long overdue call for a required course in American history and government. Although ACTA prefers for boards of trustees themselves to initiate such requirements, when this does not happen, it falls to state legislatures to address the growing and well-documented -docu disease of civic <coughs> ignorance among college graduates. And the clear provisions in this bill are highly commendable. The bill's proactivity is timely because it addresses another campus disease, the stifling of socio-political debate and discussion and the erosion of intellectual diversity. Over the past few months, my organization has surveyed students at the Ohio State University. Unique in the robust number of respondents 2003 to be exact, our survey provides solid data on not only the overall state of freedom of expression at the university, but also the experiences of population subgroups. The findings, which are soon to be published in full, are not reassuring, and they encourage us to embrace the bold thinking of Senate Bill 83. No one should imagine that what we found at OSU does not apply to more institutions in Ohio and across the entire nation. Here is one example from the survey. We asked the student sample, on your campus, how often have you felt that you could not express your opinion on a subject because of how students, a professor, or the administration would respond? Our preliminary data found that 21% answered fairly often or very often but that's not the whole story. A frightening 48% of our Republican sample answered either fairly often or very often. And that figure fell to just 8% among students who support democratic uh, policies. To give one more example, we asked students, how many friends on campus do you yeah, have um, who adhere to a different right political now, ideology? Among Republicans, 62% said and about half you or more. And then, but among Democrats, <clears throat> only 28% answered the, the about half or more. Part A surprising 35% of Democrats uh, said just one or two or none, and only 9% of Republicans selected either of those choices. How, I ask, is the Ohio State University going to live up to its motto education for citizenship, when so many students affiliated with one of America's two major political parties are afraid to speak up on campus? Is OSU helping to form citizens who are prepared to live together and negotiate 
with one another when so few students have friends from across the political aisle. It would be a mistake, I repeat, to think that these findings at the Ohio State University are not paralleled elsewhere. The data show that OSU must do more to encourage free and open discourse from a diversity of perspectives on its campus. Thus, we are impressed to see in section 3345.0217, to be exact, that it echoes the magisterial words of the American Association of University Professors, the AAUP, in its Declaration of Principles on Academic Freedom and Academic Tenure. That document admonishes faculty and staff to allow and encourage students to reach their own conclusions. The AAUP laid down the principle, and by the way, that included the input of our great American philosopher, John Dewey, that, I quote here, the university teacher in giving instruction upon controversial matters, if he is fit for his profession, should above all remember that his business is not to provide his students with ready-made conclusions, but to train them to think for themselves and to provide them access to those materials which they need if they are to think intelligently. Professor Arcus' testimony has given data on the political and ideological imbalance of professors. Uh, in my written testimony that I've submitted, I add yet more documentation to that. And I ask the question, do we wonder at the erosion of intellectual, and di intellectual diversity and vibrant discussion when we see these findings? We are pleased that Ohio lawmakers are both asking how your state can become a leader in campus freedom of inquiry and expression, and also recognizing that the free exchange of ideas will require remedial action. I doubt that anyone in this room would disagree with the statement that diverse perspectives foster breakthroughs in our understanding. Scott Page's 2007 book, the title, The Difference, How the Power of Diversity Creates Better Groups, Firms, Schools, and Societies, makes it abundantly <clears throat> clear. What Senate Bill 83 seeks to redress is the power of bureaucratic offices commonly known as diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI offices, which despite their fair sounding name, do more to obstruct intellectual diversity that is the very lifeblood of higher education and American progress, rather than to improve it. The news in American higher education is riddled with stories about conflicts between DEI and free expression and intellectual diversity. The story of Stanford Law School's DEI Dean's intervention during the shoutdown of Fifth Circuit Judge Kyle Duncan is just the latest widely reported example. Mandatory diversity statements in hiring, promotion, and admission are an especially troubling trend. The title of an article in the February 4, 2023 issue of The Economist of London tells us that we are making fools of ourselves in the eyes of the world. I quote, American universities are hiring based on devotion to diversity. Mandatory statements are quickly taking hold of academia. I commend that well-balanced article to everyone's attention. At the moment, it appears that one in five faculty hires is to some degree dependent upon the candidate's diversity statement. At the University of California, Berkeley, the hypothetical answer, you can find this on their website, I always invite and welcome students from all backgrounds to participate in my research lab, and in fact have mentored several women, would likely end the applicant's eligibility for a faculty position. How many young Albert Einsteins are being cut on Berkeley's diversity chopping block? Some programs at Ohio universities are already using mandatory diversity statements for hiring and promotion. Such requirements are likely to spread without bold legislative action such as Senate Bill 83. Please note the importance of Senate Bill 83 and be aware of the danger of inaction. Please heed the words of Keith Whittington, 
political scientist at Princeton University, and I quote, there are a lot of similarities between these diversity statements as they're being applied now and how loyalty oaths, which once required faculty to attest that they were not communists, worked. I um, commend to you, not out of ego, but just for more information, uh, I published today a column in Forbes called Do DEI Offices Help or Harm Diversity? It is worth noting regarding section 30, 3345.80 that Berkeley's Division of Equity and Inclusion has a budget of $36 million in 2020. This money goes to salaries and programming in DEI. It does not increase diversity by the logical process of awarding more need-based scholarships. And in fact, we tracked the data, the federal data from 2010 through 2021 for Berkeley's African-American student population. It's gone down from a frighteningly low 3% to an even more frighteningly low 2% despite all of that money being poured into the diversity and inclusion office at Berkeley with its 152 full-time staff and its $36 million budget. To reiterate, Senate Bill 83 is a strong and visionary bill. My organization looks forward to being a resource for this legislature as it works on refinements, <coughs> improvements that will strengthen this omnibus bill. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor. Uh, are there any questions for the Professor? Yes, Senator Ingram. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. So improvements like what, in which sections? Uh, I, I would um, notice a few things and be happy to work more comprehensively. Um, I would like to see a, um, a provision that will follow the guidance of what we've seen in the Fifth Circuit and the Seventh Circuit to eliminate um, bias response teams, which the courts have ruled have a, an influence in chilling freedom of speech. Um, I would like to see, um, and I, I will share all of these freely, um, more explicit quotation from the University of Chicago Calvin Committee report on institutional neutrality. Um, I can add a few technical things as a professor that um, in doing post-tenure reviews, which I think are a brilliant and much needed idea, that the possibility is open of using evaluators from outside the institution. These are the kinds of things that I, I would respectfully submit that could make this uh, very good bill an even stronger bill. No, thank you, Professor. Anybody else? Any other questions? Professor, thank you for your testimony today. Thank you for thank coming. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. 